Now, I, I spoke with Dr. Giorgio and others, and we might try and bump up the presentations because we do know that your time is valuable. Um, Dr. Giorgio, are you ready to present now? Sure, I'm ready. All right, so let's jump in a little bit earlier than the time that we had originally posted. Um, so take it away. Okay, uh, just give me a second to share my screen. So again, while Dr. Giorgio is presenting, if you do have any questions, please feel free to put them in the question and answer um, portion of Zoom and I will address them. Uh, and also if you have questions that you want to save for the panel session, you could uh, put them and just put panel as the heading. Go ahead. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning for um, this session on comprehensive approach to improving literacy. It's my pleasure to join this uh, symposium because I am uh, going to present with uh, esteemed colleagues, some of whom I, I presented in the past, like Dr. Um, Matthew Kirstad, and some of whom I will be presenting for the first time. Um, Pamela Gilbert, the uh, superintendent of Lakeland Catholic, and Heather Wilson. So I'm, I'm quite um, delighted to be part of this. Uh, when I was asked by Catherine about a possible topic, I thought that it would make sense to have multiple people presenting their own experiences from their own um, capacity, their own role within the educational system. Because we often listen to professors on their own, they, they present their own research. We talk to superintendents on their own, they talk about their stuff. But we never looked at synergies. We have never really looked at ways in which these people should be ideally working together to achieve um, the improvement of children's literacy performance. And I think the experiences we have gained over the last 15 years working with uh, these individuals in Alberta has, um, have allowed us to have a very solid understanding of what it takes to improve literacy. And we have achieved quite significant results that we are happy to share with you today. So a few things about myself. Um, I come from, originally come from that little island that is called Cyprus, that is just below Turkey to the left of Lebanon uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. I, when I moved here and I was uh, saying that I'm from Cyprus, they thought that I was from the Cyprus Hills just outside of Alberta but um, it's spelled with a U-S at the end, not with e -double -S. So I made the uh, trip 7,000 miles uh, to the west to come to the U of A in 2002 to do my master's and then PhD. I had a short break after my PhD where I did uh, a postdoc at the University of Uvashkula in Finland. And then I came back, I rejoined the U of A as a faculty member in 2008. Since 2008, I am um, a professor in the department, used to be in the Department of Educational Psychology now. As of July 1st, 2022, it's faculty of education, no departments. And um, I, this is a picture I worked for two years. I have a MBA degree. I worked for two years from 2000 to 2002 as a teacher in Cyprus. And um, I am now the director of the Reading Research Laboratory. These are some of my students. Some of them have graduated and uh, some of them have gone to other countries. In 2018, um, I was inducted into the Royal Society of Canada for the impact of my research uh, on the society and the education in general. And that I consider that as the highest achievement um, that I have received. So to go back to the presentation, I think that this figure is guiding my work to a large extent. 
because we have conducted the research at all three different tier levels. Tier one, this stand the RTI, the response to intervention you might be familiar with, represents this pyramid where at tier one, you provide high quality instruction, you do screening, you do classroom um, intervention or instruction, and you keep monitoring the kids' performance, those who struggle, the few of them, they received more targeted intervention at a tier two level. Now there is a little bit of disagreement when, whether the tier two happens within the classrooms or outside of the classrooms. I think that that's neither here or there. The point is that there are some kids who get more targeted intervention. And following assessment, there should be about 5% of the kids who continue to struggle, and we should be providing them with more intensive intervention. And that is the tier three. Now with my colleagues, uh, Robert Savage, we have been thinking a lot about the tier three interventions in the last year or so. And we have reviewed the literature extensively. There has not been much work at the tier three level. So, there are a lot of studies, including my research on what good quality classroom instruction looks like, when should we be screening for reading difficulties for all the kids, what group of assessments works a lot or better for identifying the kids, what is the sensitivity of the measures, what the specificity of the measures that we are using what are the results of tier two interventions? And, and I know that, uh, Catherine mentioned some of the work we did here in Alberta, and I will be re re referring to it later on. So having that knowledge at all these three tier levels, we started thinking about what's the best way of sharing that knowledge with schools and what's the best way of helping the kids. Why? Because the hard reality that we see nowadays in our schools is that the numbers that we get do not match the numbers that we should be receiving from the RTI based on previous research that has been done. So in, in 2017, there was a report in Edmonton Journal that the Edmonton Public School Board kids 27% of, of them were reading below grade level. And there was something else released um, in 2021 as a result of COVID saying that the kids in that school division deteriorated in their reading and math performance over the last five years. So if that was 27% tw in 2017 and it deteriorated, you can imagine where that might be right now. But more recently, Alberta Education had asked all the schools to report on the number of grade two and three, uh, sorry, grade one to three kids in Alberta who were reading below grade level so that they would provide funding for these kids to receive pull out intervention. Of the 160,000 kids enrolled in these grade levels, I think 54,000 kids were reported as being struggling. And reading and, and meeting the cutoff scores reported by Alberta Ed to uh, receive intervention. And that's about 32%. In other words, of the kids who are registered in these early grade levels, one in three kids was found by the schools, by the teachers to experience reading difficulties and needing additional support. So the question is that if we should be having about 20% struggling kids that need some intervention and 5% of kids who need tier three intervention, how come we have more than 30%? and what, importantly, what we should be doing to address this. 
that's something that was in my head for years, being also a classroom teacher, seeing the kids in a classroom and realizing that some of my students were not reading at grade level, having discussions with different school divisions here in Edmonton and talking to principals and telling me about the number of struggling kids that they have been having and what they have been doing. So at that time, about 14 years ago, I was very um, lucky to uh, have discussions with a principal of a large school here in Edmonton who had been coordinating other principals as well. And they got together with me to discuss this issue at a time where I was about to start my own research in Alberta on um, reading development in English and its predictors. So through this process and the interactions with principals, we have identified three key elements and I'm, I'm calling them the Alberta made solution to this. And believe me, it is working beautifully. At least those who have tried it and those who have engaged um, uh, into the practices and um, into what we have been sharing with them, full force, full heart, and uh, fully committed. So what are these three elements? It's ongoing training of teachers on best practices. Unfortunately, we know that most teachers who graduate from universities have very little knowledge of what struggling kids look like, how to identify them, and most importantly, what to do with these kids once they identify them. The solution is not to hire EAs or special ed people so that we can pass these kids on to these experts to uh, help them but the teachers in the regular classroom also need to know what to do with these kids. So we had started providing training to teachers, not just come in, attend to George, presenting for one time for two hours and then that's it. There were continuous sessions with these teachers Often, uh, quite often, these teachers were coming back the second year and the year after, because for many of these teachers who had very little idea about what I was talking about, they, they, it was very hard to absorb all the information the first time. So they had to listen to me a second time, a third time, go back to their classrooms, try out a few things that we had said in the presentations, come back with more questions, modify their instruction accordingly until we get it right. So it's ongoing, it's not a one-time training. I mentioned this because what we have also seen from some school divisions that are not doing very well is that they are sending their teachers to some professional development. And they think that by having their teachers listening to some presenters for an hour or two, that will miraculously change their practices and all of the kids in their classrooms will be performing perfectly fine. That will not happen. Second, we realize that beyond training, you need to have some measures to assess the kids in order to identify who is at risk for reading difficulties and also monitor the performance of the kids so that if you provide classroom instruction, you can see whether your whole classroom improves, whether some kids improve but some others don't. You need to measure how much growth they have made. If they are meeting the target of the school, uh, of the grade level or not. And importantly, for the kids who receive intervention, you need to have this assessment so that you can estimate whether they need additional support or whether you can graduate them from the intervention. The whole point is not to keep these kids in the intervention for a long time. 
You need to provide them short, intensive, targeted interventions so that soon after they make enough gains, they can go back to their classroom. What we have seen in many of the schools is that the kids who were identified as struggling kids, every single year it was the same kids who were receiving intervention and they did not have really good assessments in place to tell whether this kid really needed the intervention or not. We also need um, evidence-based tier two and three intervention programs. I'm saying this because unfortunately, particularly in Alberta, we have been used, many school divisions have been using um, intervention programs that do not have a lot of support from research as being evidence-based. In other words, if you will be investing $2 million on a program, for your school division, make sure that it is actually effective based on previous research. And when I say previous research, I don't mean one study conducted by the authors of the intervention program. I mean independent, peer-reviewed, published uh, uh, results in very good journals and not just one study. So we worked also on that area with uh, teachers and principals. And I know that um, Pamela and later on Matthew might be talking about this for their own schools. So for many of us, we have heard this expression so many times, early prevention is the best intervention. Now it's the motto that has attracted most interest it is used not only for education, but in other fields as well. But we don't really understand very well, or most educators don't understand very well, what it means by saying early prevention. We have not really started talking about what does early mean and what does this prevention mean? And today we know very well that early does not mean grade three. Does not mean wait until the child fails in reading so you can then refer the child for psychoeducational assessment and subsequently provide intervention. That might be too late. Early, according to research, means kindergarten. So I will repeat this. Kindergarten is probably the best time to prevent reading difficulties from happening. We know that in kindergarten, there are ways of identifying who will be the struggling readers later on with high accuracy. And since we have the ability to identify them, there is a way to intervene early and, pro and provide these kids an opportunity to be successful readers later on. I know that some school divisions and, and probably um, Pamela is, in, uh, is on the way to do this, but some other school divisions that have started doing the assessments early on and they figured out how to, the whole system works from grade one onward now they have also uh, been screening their students in kindergarten to identify the ones who are at risk. And they have been providing intervention to these kids during the second half of kindergarten. And by the time these kids go to grade one, half of them or even more than half have already benefited to the point that they no longer need additional support. So we have to do some screening in order to prevent the reading difficulties from happening. The reason being is that there are lots of studies that, that they say, and they have shown that the teachers might be okay in identifying like the kids who will be struggling, but they're not very accurate. Like, 
high accuracy. They might be about 60% correct, but 60% is not a high number. You need to have at least 90% accuracy in your measurements. Therefore, by using just teacher's judgment is not good enough to prevent the reading difficulties from happening. And there are several studies that have been published from Finnish groups on, on this topic, how accurate different people and different groups of assessments are. And they all agree to the fact that teachers are okay to do some scanning of what their kids can do or some informal assessments perhaps that can give them an idea of who is at risk, but they also need some serious assessments in place to accompany their own judgment so that they can have better chances to identify the kids who will be struggling later on. Having this in mind, when we started the work with schools here in Alberta, in Edmonton, Many of the teachers and many of the schools were using the FNP and they had complained that they had not seen any changes over the last 20 years in their kids' performance and that it was taking teachers too long and they needed something that was more standardized or what I call norm referenced assessments. And at that time, they Sorry, Dr. Called, Giorgio, could you just um, define what FNP is and what it looks like? Yeah, it's the Funtas and Pinel. It's the Funtas and Pinel reading assessment. It's used by several schools. So when we started um, talking about the assessments, the teachers and the principal said that they needed something that would that teachers could administer. They did not want external uh, people to walk into the schools to do the assessments. And they had to provide them with um, standard scores. So compare the performance of a child, like any given child in their classroom to norms across North America. Now, I am providing you this information because now these three assessments, what teachers call the three T's, because they all start with the T letter, is a group of assessments that Dr. Giorgio and eight principals in Edmonton Public School Division came up with. There is no publisher who said, use these three assessments and this is the gold standard of screening. These are the assessments that we came up based on the criteria that I will be presenting to you in the next slide. Now, if they have, there, are, there might be other assessments that they may be doing an equally good job. I'm not saying that this is the best possible set. This is a set of tasks that do the job that we want them to do and we have tested them and they provide us a very good picture of what the kids can do and the teachers feel comfortable administering. There might be, I want to be very clear that nobody we didn't have an epiphany one day and said these are the top three. We just tried out different combinations. These are the ones that we feel comfortable using. If you were to ask me as a professional, George, is there something else that you would add to this? Perhaps I would say if we had more time and we wanted teachers to do a bit more, I would like to have a vocabulary task in the mix of these assessments. Now, these are the criteria that those uh, principals and I worked with in order to come up with that list of assessments. The um, 
they had to be quick. So the fact that they, you have to test the kids, you don't need to spend like an hour with each child individually. You can do an equally good job with uh, shorter tasks that are perhaps more reliable and, and more valid and teachers can administer them. The test should also have alternate forms. We wanted to have alternate forms so that teachers could administer these tasks over the year, multiple times. And we decided September, January, and May. Again, that was arbitrary. We thought, okay, you need something at the beginning of the school year. You need something at the end of the school year too, to see whether where the kids are before they graduate that grade level. But you also need something in between. So we thought, okay, January is a good time after they come back from their holidays. The most important, I think, criterion was that jointly these assessments, they should provide you a, a relatively good picture about the kids' knowledge of the foundational skills or what Catherine talked earlier about the National Reading Panel and the five literacy uh, pillars of literacy. So phonological awareness, phonics, fluency, uh, vocabulary, and reading comprehension. So the assessment that you see here, the first one is a measure of reading fluency. The second one, we use it as a snapshot of reading comprehension. And the last one, we use particularly the non-word part of it as a measure of phonics. So you see, we don't really have a specific one for vocabulary even though the TOSREC, unless you know the meaning of the words, you cannot really answer correctly those sentences. So we get, we get some idea about the vocabulary from TOSREC. Now, there are four ways to look at the data that teachers collect at the end of um, each assessment. You can look at them at the school level. If you have multiple schools, you can look at them at the grade level, class level, and student level. For example, in this case, the TOSREF, you can see that in this school A and school B, they administered the same assessment. You can see how much growth they made from a form A to form B. And these numbers are standard scores, by the way. Ideally, you need 100 to be average and on target. So you see that in, um, in school A, by January, grades 4, 5, and 6, they were already at grade level. Grades 1 to 3, they were well behind uh, grade level, but they had shown some signs of improvement since the assessment in September. You can also compare the schools, and that's what uh, the reason I presented this slide. You can see that school B in grades two and three, they were already at grade level, but grades four and five, they were well below the exact opposite picture of school A. So this allows for um, interesting conversations between schools to see what these early school teachers in school B, what they are doing that allows that school to be successful and meeting the standards as opposed to school A that they're behind. And the opposite happens for upper elementary grades. You can also look at grade level. So aggregate the data across all of your students within a given grade, and you can see where each grade is. So in this case, grades four, five, and six, they are already at grade level in um, January. And all of your grades have shown some growth over time. And again, these are standard scores, not row scores. And I mentioned this because it means that any growth is independent of children's maturation. You can look at class level data. So in this case, all of the classes at one given grade, they started about the same. 
they continue to grow. Now everybody is in green, so they are within average, above trade level. And by May, everybody is even higher. Class two is doing much better than any other trade, cl other class, which tells you that let's talk to that teacher and find out what she's doing, what he's doing in his class. That is producing better results and everybody else can benefit. You can also look at the profile of each child. So in this case, clearly student number one has a problem in, in TOSREC and TOSREC is used here as a measure of reading comprehension and vocabulary. So for that student, I will be doing more work on reading comprehension and vocabulary. For student number two, you can see that the performance is lower across the board, but much lower in tower phonics. So I will be working with that child more intensively in his or her phonics. Student number three, lower scores in TOSREC, so that child will receive more intensive instruction in, um, in reading comprehension and vocabulary. Now, these, those are the tasks that I have been using with the schools I have been working. And I keep using them because we have seen great success. Again, I'm saying this is not the possibly the only set of tasks that you can use. This is a set of tasks that we found that they work, that teachers can administer them easily and they understand the scores and we get nice information and valuable information to um, direct instruction. Alberta Education, on the basis of this whole work that has been done with schools, and the improvement that many of the schools divisions have shown, they have called us and they said, particularly when COVID started and they needed to support schools immediately, they called me and some of my colleagues to help them provide some reliable assessments so that they could share them with schools across Alberta to screen their students who are struggling for reading so that they would provide them with proper intervention. And at that time, in a short notice, we um, came into agreement with Castles and Cold Card. I noticed there should be an L after a P in Castles name. Castles and Cold Heart, uh, they are colleagues of Dr. Rano Porilla at Macquarie University. And they have graciously agreed to share their reading screener for the purpose of using it in Alberta only. So we have special licensing with these individuals to use their assessment in Alberta. Now that task has three um, conditions, regular words, irregular words, and non-words. This is exactly the same as the diagnostic test of word reading processes, a commercially available product, particularly in uh, the UK, you can purchase it. It has similar categories, similar scoring, et cetera. So I'm just mentioning this to you because when we share this with teachers in Alberta, they said, why are you giving me a list of non-words to read for the kids? Do I need to test all three conditions? Can I only test them on real words or exception words and not non-words? All sorts of questions. These, there are good reasons why these conditions are there. It's to assess all aspects related to the foundational skills in word recognition, just like sight word recognition and phonics. We also provided schools with another task called letter name sound test from Dr. Rano Parilla and Saskia Kohnen. And that is primarily used in grade one to help the teachers identify how many letter sound correspondences that the students know in order to help them with planning and teaching in their own classroom. 
Now I'm very pleased that Alberta Education has made it mandatory to screen all the kids in grades one to three as of September 2022. And they want the schools to report back to Alberta Education with the number of kids that they are struggling so that they can get funding and also how many of these kids continue to struggle after they receive intervention. As you can imagine, this is a huge milestone as far as I know in the history of education in Canada because here is a Ministry of Education that is taking some action to make sure that all the schools are doing the screening early on, ideally before grade three, so that the kids have a fair chance to improve after they receive intervention. I should say that these assessments have been provided not only in English, but also in French. So French immersion and Francophone schools are also administering these assessments to their students. And we have done the same for numeracy. So we develop assessments that grade one to three schools are using in Alberta to screen for mathematics difficulties. Now, if we were to stop at the assessments as what happens in 90% of the school divisions in Alberta and probably elsewhere, nothing would have changed. The whole point is not to collect data and pile them up. The whole point is to use the data to inform instruction and plan for your students. Therefore, we use the information to develop assess intervention programs to support the kids who have been struggling. And you may be aware or have heard in the past of um, the intervention program that took place in several schools here in Edmonton with huge success where we followed the same kids from grade one, all classrooms. We did not exclude anybody unless they, they were not um, um, having the um, right sensory um, abilities to perform the task. We followed these kids from grade one all the way to grade three. We trained their teachers to provide evidence-based practices in the whole classroom. And we also provided pull-out intervention to the students for three times a week, 30 minutes each time for about three and a half months from grade one, again in grade two, and again in grade three. By grade three, there were three kids out of 290 who started this program who remained poor readers. And that was 1.4% of the kids. If I'm not mistaken, this is the best um, achievement of any intervention program that I have read to date. Now, many of the schools that Inclu were included in this, they continue to use these intervention programs. And as far as I know, they have, they continue to achieve similar results. More recently, as a result of COVID, we also tried um, an inter small group intervention, pull out intervention with kids from four school divisions, St. Albert Catholic, Lakeland Catholic, Black Old School Division and um, Fort Vermilion School Division. 83 classes across these four school divisions, 362 struggling grade two and three kids. We trained teachers in these schools. Some of them were special education teachers. Some of them were educational assistants, some of them were regular classroom teachers that were receiving them some release time to provide this intervention. We also had two principals who provided intervention themselves because they wanted and insisted that they wanted to do it. So we trained them to do it. 
And after four and a half months of intervention, 80% of the 362 kids improved in their standard scores in word reading by 1.5 years. So in four and a half months, they improved by 1.5 years. And 70% of them do not need additional intervention. Now, you can see that 70%, it means that there are 30% of these kids who will qualify or need additional support. They may, these are kids who will be going into what we call tier three intervention. Now, on the basis of these findings, again, um, Alberta Education came and said, this is very promising, George, um, and very exciting. We want to have to support all of our students and all of our schools in Alberta. So can you please uh, develop um, an intervention program or share your intervention program with Alberta Education to be shared with all the schools in Alberta? And my doctoral student, Christy Dunn, and I worked on this we provided this um, 589, I left that on purpose on the top of this slide. You can see this is the first page of, out of 589 pages worth of materials on systematic instruction in phonics for grades one to three. So our Alberta Education made this available with all the teachers in and schools in Alberta to use for free. And I'm, I'm very pleased that they have done that. Now, I, before I finish, I will um, refer to an article that we published a few years ago in, in 2020 with a principal, from, former principal of Edmonton Public, Greg Kushner, and, and my colleague, Rauno Parilla. We had been following the performance of this school for a couple of years, and year after year after year, they were improving in their literacy scores using the standardized measures that I mentioned earlier. So we thought this is an excellent example of a school that we want to look deeper into what makes them a successful school, what makes the teachers so good to provide instruction that all the kids on average improve year after year. And they were not just reading at grade level, they were performing well above grade level every single year. So we wanted to find out what factors contribute to this success. And we gave a questionnaire to the 20 um, language arts teachers in that school and asked them to rate from zero to four, four was the highest on a Likert scale to tell us how much they agree with each statement. So we gave them different statements. For example, the common formative assessments given by grade level teams. So these teachers, they, the average was 3.87. The use of data from standardized assessment. The professional development they got on the five pillars of reading. The professional development on reading offered by the school board. And many, so all these um, items that you see there, it's clear that there are some scores that are quite high, like the common formative assessments given by grade level teams. So the teachers feel themselves that the fact that they have been giving these formative assessments within grade level and they discuss them, this is very important. They rated almost at the maximum, which is number four. But you also have items like the professional development they received from the school board that was rated the lowest. 
And also the, at the very bottom of this slide, you can see that there is an item that says having support from parents. That was also very rated quite low. So there are three themes that came up from these uh, statements. The first is that teachers collaborate weekly on their own learning and plan instruction together. They felt this is a very important feature of their success, that you allow them about an hour a week to work jointly with other teachers of the same grade level to plan, to enhance their learning and plan for their instruction. The fact that they have been using formative assessments and they, they are, these assessments are not hidden from anybody else. They are shared with each other in that same grade level and they use the data to inform areas of growth. You know, you remember, I still remember when Alberta Education released, um, made the announcement about the mandatory screening last May and the same day, Alberta Teachers Association released a statement that assessments are unnecessary and teachers know how to best assess their students and Alberta Education doesn't need to provide any assessments. Well, here is what teachers have said from a school that has been successful, that the fact they are using the standardized assessments has helped them improving their practice and plan their instruction for these kids. And as a result, their kids are improving in reading. Another important aspect of this questionnaire that we gave was that the school focuses on improving reading and believes in the child's continuous growth. So it's not one person's uh, journey. It's not one person's job to improve the literacy of all the kids, but the principal is involved, the literacy consultants are involved, the teachers are involved, and perhaps the parents are also involved. So I will conclude my presentation with uh, these five points. If you were to ask me in the last 15 years what you have learned, George, in this process, I would say the first thing I've learned is to persevere. I always remind myself that Rome was not built in one day. And I try to um, share this with the school divisions because it's often thought that if we teach our, if we train our teachers and we use the assessments and have us interventions, everything will be solved in three or six months. No. If Poor practices have been in place for a long time. It takes a long time to fix those problems and establish good practices. So Rome was not built in one day. Keep this in mind the same way that I remind myself. It's also a joint effort. It's not George's job or by calling George to provide training to your teachers, it's not going to solve the, the problem. You need everybody to be part of this literacy-wide initiative at your school or within your school division. I also say that there is no silver bullet. If you're looking for one, good luck finding it. Why? Because even the intervention programs that we have published and they are commercially available, none of them is 100% effective. Uh, you are lucky if you find programs that are 80% effective. It all depends on the kids, on the nature of the difficulties they have, the grade level, the intensity that you will provide these interventions, etc. You also need to have a long-term plan and to develop a structure of supporting your teachers. By asking if you are a superintendent and you say, you call your principals and say, fix your reading problem, that will not help. Or if you're a principal and you say you find the way to solve your problem, it's your teacher's issue and your class problem, then it will not help either. 
You need to come together as a school division. You need to come together as a school, have discussions, contact the researchers who have done this work, contact successful schools, those schools who have done their work in the past and they are doing very well so that they, you can get some help. Finally, um, you are allowed to make mistakes. Please keep this in mind. We learned from our errors. We, have, we haven't had an epiphany and we get it right from the very beginning. This, what I described to you with the assessment, the interventions, etc. we tried different things over time. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work, but we learn from our mistakes and we fix the problems so that we can then provide the best advice to the schools. So open to the idea that there might be a period where you might be allowed to make a mistake. This will help you learn from your mistake and get better. So I'll stop here and, and get any answer, any questions that you may be having. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Giorgio. That was amazing presentation uh, and so much information to soak in. We do have some questions. Uh, and the first one is, would the CC3 assessment be comparable to the TOWRI? Um, and I, I think the important thing to note there is it's comparable, but it's not at the same time because you have three different lists of words where the, the decodable and the um, non-decodable or the, the ones that are more difficult to decode are separate, right? So, so the Taur is a timed uh, reading assessment. It's you, you put a page in front of a child and you say, start reading and I will tell you uh, as fast as you can, I will tell you when to stop. And you give them 45 seconds for real words. And then there is a non-word card. Mm -hmm. So the real word card has both regular and irregular words mixed up. In CC3, as well as in the test diagnostic test of word reading processes, these are accuracy measures. There is no speed requirement. You don't tell the child, read as fast as you can. You tell the child, read as accurately as you can. And you say, okay, let's try the next item within a reasonable amount of time. So you don't give them a minute, let's say, to try an, uh, an item. After a few seconds, you say, okay, let's try the next item. But it's not timed. And the score there is how many words you read correctly or non-words. And so these two, even though they are measuring partly the same skills, so real word reading and non-word reading, one is timed, the other one is not timed. So you cannot use these two interchangeably. Oh, let me give this today and in a month I will give CC3. You cannot do that. Yeah, so the, the TARI definitely adds that fluency component to it uh, where the CC3 allows the student to, you know, uh, decode the word and then blend it together and not penalize them for that. Correct. The next question is, is there a vocabulary assessment that you would recommend? Yeah, this is, this is a very good uh, point. Um, unfortunately, the most widely used vocabulary assessments like Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test or the, um, the Wechsler uh, from the WISC, the Expressive Vocabulary, Either they require level C uh, assessment skills so teachers cannot administer them in their classroom or they are individually administered and they take about 15 minutes per child. So given the criteria that I described earlier, we haven't yet identified 
a vocabulary assessment that can be given to the whole class and be done quickly, like in five minutes. There is one, it's called GRAID, G-R-A-D-E. GRAID has multiple tests in a booklet. It has word reading, it has listening comprehension, it has reading comprehension, it has word vocabulary. The word vocabulary, basically, it has rows of pictures, and the teacher will be either say a word, and then the, the kids have to circle the picture that depicts the meaning of the word that the teacher has said, or they read a word on the site, let's say in broom, and then there are pictures, including a broom, to the right of that word, and they have to circle it. Now, if, if the kids have to read the word, then it becomes a word reading task and that introduces other factors. So I'm not very pleased with that assessment either. So we are, this is an open question. We are still trying to come up with a task that measures vocabulary very well. Well, and I think that it's important to note that there are different levels of vocabulary that need to be assessed and uh, the biases and cultural biases that go within different communities. It's very difficult to create a vocabulary test that is broad enough to capture the needs of all students at a standardized way. And whether we're looking at those tier one words, which are words that children should be picking up in every conversa- everyday conversation, and the tier two that are the more academic words, and the ones that we're seeing more in formal writing, and the tier three, which are the very specific words, we need to figure out what is the best way to measure that and what it means for the students' reading comprehension in the future. Now, what grades get assessed with these screeners for the research that you've been talking about? Uh, Grades of one to nine. You can also have grades 10 to 12 assessed, but uh, the conversion tables that we have created and the spreadsheets we have created to do these conversions automatically, and we shared with the schools, they go from grade one to nine. So we haven't done the conversions for grades 10 to 12, simply because the schools that started this were elementary schools or elementary plus junior high, and we didn't think we have to engage also in doing conversion tables for um, high school. That was a lot of work. So we avoided grades 10 to 12. Of course. Now you mentioned it's, it's one to 12, uh, one to nine. Uh, one thing for not everyone listening to this conversation is uh, in Alberta or familiar with the Alberta school system, but uh, the kindergarten program is not essential and it's not the same. It's not a five day a week, full day program. Um, so can you give listeners that are in locations where they do have kindergarten, your recommendations? Is there, there a screening measure that you'd like to see? Would you include more of that phonological awareness screening element within the test? Yeah. The schools, that school divisions that have been screening in kindergarten, they are using uh, seat top. Mm-hmm. the uh, comprehensive test of phonological processing battery that mm-hmm. has measures of phonological awareness, rapid naming, and short-term memory. And they also use PPVT for vocabulary. The Peabody picture vocabulary. Yeah. Now, when we're looking at these measures, these are standardized measures that unfortunately have a cost related to them, Right. Uh, and batteries, there are questions about whether Alberta teachers have access to these tests and if there's a a fee associated with it that the school's responsible for. You mean the uh, uh, reading screeners and and seat? Yeah. Yeah, no, the the school divisions are that are part of this uh, initiative and they participate in training their teachers and and on these assessments, they purchase these assessments for their schools. 
And compared to the cost, I think Pamela can probably speak more to that, but compared to the, the, um, what the cost of assessments that they had in place in the past, these are quite less expensive assessments to have and more valuable. So the school divisions are purchasing these assessments for their schools and teachers. Wonderful. Now, do you have any recommendations? I should add though that the uh, CC3 and the lens and, and the early numeracy screener and in the, now we are working with Alberta Ed to develop a reading fluency and a reading comprehension assessment. This will be, these are totally free for the schools. And if in the future, and that's my hope that if we develop local norms and that's the intention, we will probably be the first province in Canada to have locally developed norms for free reading assessments and numeracy assessments that schools can have and they can use for their students three times a year. Wonderful. Now, I want to take a moment to just discuss the importance of those standardized assessments and the standardized score. You mentioned a bit in your presentation how the difference between the raw score and the standardized score. When we look at raw scores, we don't really have a meaning associated with it. So if you're just saying, oh, okay, they read 10 words out of 20 words. Well, what does that mean in comparison to other students? And when we do the conversion to the standardized score, uh, scores based on a normative sample, we're looking at based on other students, their age, how or in their grade, depending on the norms that you use, how do they compare? And how has the improvement happened over the time? Is it appropriate and expected or have they exceeded, right? So if you see a student with a standardized score in September of 100 and they stay at 100 in the, the January and the June testing, they are keeping up with where they should be right? If you have a student that goes from 80 to 100, well, that's a great jump in their improvement. So we're not only keeping them up with where they should be, we're allowing them to improve at a rate that's the goal of our instruction and intervention in the, the tier two and the tier three. Now, can you speak to the different norming samples and why it's so important to have that specific Alberta norm as opposed to using the standardized norms that you purchase with a test kit? Yeah, right now, uh, all of the, with the exception of the WIAT 3, all of the other assessments, they, they are, their norms and their samples were collected in the U.S. So all of their uh, normative samples and standardization process happened in the U.S. Now, that may not be from our data, may not be a problem from grade three onward because pretty much our kids, they do the same as the kids in the U.S. in these grade levels. But in kindergarten to grade two, it's a little bit problematic because the kids in the U.S., they go to school earlier, they know um, they have a very intensive or in most cases intensive PA or, or phonics programs, letter knowledge is better. So they go to school and, and with much higher scores. So when you give these ass assessments to our grade one and two kids, they always uh, perform lower and it could be quite alarming, but that could be a result, at least two to three standard points lower than the American norms because of the background. And the fact that they go to kindergarten and preschool, et cetera, and they know all of these concepts earlier than our kids. So there is a need for developing local norms. Ideally, we should do that across Canada, but I am not going to, re to invent the wheel here. I can do as much as I can within my limits and 
Right now, we know that there is appetite in Alberta. We have the support of Alberta Education. So we will be doing this at least for our teachers and our uh, students in Alberta. So you need local norms. Local norms are the best that you, you can have. Sorry, I forgot I muted myself. <laughs> um, with the local norms, we're going to be able to see something more authentic to where the students are and representative of their education. As I mentioned earlier, in Alberta, the kindergarten is optional and has a different format than other areas in the country. So even with the development of Alberta norms, looking at whether the kindergarten program was attended or not is going to have an influence on the student's ability. Uh, the next question is, what are the essentials to look for in an effective literacy intervention program? Um, it has to be intensive first. Forget about programs that you can give in a month and expect that the kids will be reading within grade level. Inter particularly struggling kids who, have, who are in upper elementary grades, they have faced reading difficulties for many years. These are very hard to remediate. They will need a full year of reading intervention, if not more than a year. So, and when I say intensive, it's not just um, throughout the year, it has to be done four to five times a week. So ideally every day. That is what we did with our intervention in grades two and three to allow the kids to catch up quickly. Four times a week was okay because we allowed the kids that always at the school there is a day that they have something else or they will be away. So we accounted for that. Four times a week, they would meet with their reading interventionist to get the intervention. About 30 to 40 minutes each time, that's a reasonable time where the, you can have their full attention. Anything more than 30 to 40 minutes, so if you go to an hour, typically that's too much, and struggling kids often get distracted. You will not be having their full attention for an hour. And they have to be also administered by trained individuals. A very important thing to mention, because when I tried these pull-out interventions four years ago, and I told the school divisions we need interventionists, and I want you to send me your interventionists for training, guess who they sent me? They sent me some parents who are, were free at school, and they had free time to provide intervention. These people who will provide tier two and tier three intervention, they must be skilled interventionists, not just anybody, because they need to understand the background and the information that is included in the intervention materials. And they also need to have some good instructional skills to direct the questions to individuals and not just play ping pong with one child that responds to their questions and forget the other three kids that are in that group. So you need to have some experience with these assessments for the intervention to be effective. Yes, of course. And I know when I look for them, I, I definitely wanna see screening to identify the student's needs and progress monitoring to ensure that the students are learning the skills that you're focusing on in the lesson. You, you can't just buy a packaged program and expect it to work for all students. And that's why we need to have the screening and also to inform where the students need the intervention and instruction. When we spoke about earlier, those five keys to literacy instruction, the phonological awareness, phonics, vocabulary, fluency, and comprehension. Often I see students in the upper grades, the teachers say, oh, okay, well, you know, they don't really understand what they're reading. And they forget to assess, well, can they actually read the words? Are they developing that reading fluency so they can use the part of their brain that holds information to understand what they're reading? Or is that focusing solely on decoding and figuring out what the words say. Um, 
where do you access the a guide to systematic phonics instruction that you mentioned? It's through New Learn Alberta. So the teachers in Alberta who are, um, uh, they can enter their username, password, and when they go to that website and they can access the material there. Is it available for individuals not in Alberta? No. All right. So sorry for those of you who are not uh, listening from Alberta. The 3T reading comprehension assessment has vocabulary that my students have no clue about, such as bodyguards in the White House. Is this a fair assessment? And <laughs> Good question. And, and the, the quick one, you see why you have to also develop tasks um, locally and have local norms because some of these items are perfectly fine in the U.S. and we purchase U.S. materials because these are the only assessments that we have. Now, there might be what I recommend to the schools is that go through that list of items in TOSREC. If there is a one item or two items that you feel they are not appropriate for a Canadian students, for example, there was an item talking about Eskimos. So if it's not appropriate, I would say use wide out, delete that item totally. Why? Because the kids will not finish anyway the 60 items. So you don't want them to be impacted by that item if they don't know it and it's not appropriate. You make it even for every kid in your classroom. So delete it. But please don't start deleting every item that you think may not be aware of. Just delete one or two sentences that are inappropriate, totally inappropriate for your students. Definitely. And that speaks to the importance of actually going through the measures and spending the time to understand what's in them, uh, just as your instructional material to make sure that it's appropriate for the task you are doing. Um, Then there's a question about whether the 3T assessments actually provide much in the way of diagnostic information or are they just screening? We use them as screeners and we use them to identify quickly, reliably, who are the kids who need immediate intervention. What I made clear to the schools, and this is the only reason why teachers can administer them, because some of them require level B assessment. Now, there is a sentence in this manual that says, teachers can administer these tasks if for instructional, if they use the scores for instructional purposes only which is why we want them to do this job. We don't want them to diagnose anybody. And I taught them to refrain from diagnosing anybody as dyslexic or learning disabled or whatever. That's, that's beyond the purpose of using these assessments. We want to get a quick screener to tell us who, is the, who are the kids who are struggling how far behind they are, and whether they have been improving after they receive intervention. Definitely. And again, the reason why we're doing this is to inform instruction. So it's important that when teachers look at these screening measures and look at what is being assessed, they learn how to use that to inform their instruction and how to look at the results as a class as a whole, create those small groups for the students that, a group of students that need targeted instruction on a specific skill, and the students that you need that more intensive one-on-one intervention, uh, and not making that student that needs the tier three instruction wait and go through the other stages. Um, Is there a TOS, WRF for French immersion students? Uh, Not that I know. Okay. Um, Now, the question about uh, measures in French, that's a good one. 
with the exception of a tabel that I'm not aware of anything else that exists. Um, we are we have developed the CC3 and the lens in French, and we will be developing also two other tasks in French, and we will be norming them in Alberta. So those would probably be the first ones to have norms in French. Right. Uh, it's also that can be noted, uh, noted that if we assess phonological awareness skills in English for French immersion students, that you're still going to get effective information because phonological and phonemic awareness are transferable skills. And if these students are fluent in English, using the, the scores from an English assessment are not going to have that huge impact saying, okay, well, they're this good in English, but not in French. Um, now, there was a question as opposed to buying those measures. Now, some districts may already have these measures available to the learning support teachers, and it's just a matter of buying the protocols. And that's, you know, a case by case basis as to whether the school has to purchase the protocols or the district uh, will do them. And it would be great if we got to the point where, you know, the, the Ministry of Education just purchased it for every student within the provinces. Yeah, the other, the other very important thing to keep in mind, um, Catherine, is that when we started this process, and just like any other, anybody who will be purchasing these assessments, they have they come in the manual with conversion tables. Mm -hmm. So psychologists are doing conversions manually. Mm -hmm. All the schools that have been part of the work that I am doing with them, mm -hmm. we have developed a spreadsheet that is doing these conversions automatically. So if you are not, if you will be purchasing them on your own, or let's say a school division that you know, you just decided you will be using them. There is no conversion spreadsheet for you to do this automatically. You will be doing them manually. I just want to make this clear because you don't just get a row score and automatically convert into percentile ranks and standardized scores. We have done this in the schools that I have been working with to support the teachers to reduce down the number of time, the amount of time they would spend on doing conversions and invest the time on planning. Yes. Um, one of the users is wondering, are you aware of the French sounds by Watermelon Works where you can rapidly assess French language with accuracy for learners? No, I'm not aware of that. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Giorgio, for joining us today. You're a wealth of information and very appreciative of the things that you have contributed uh, with your research and your work. Um, before we move on to the next presentation, can you give us a little bit of information because you played a role in the redesign of the curriculum uh, in Alberta? Can you give us just a bit of an overview of how your research uh, and your experiences have impacted that and what teachers are seeing in the change. I know there's been um, some mixed emotions and feelings about this change of curriculum. And it's important that we understand why these changes are made and the importance of explicit systematic instruction for students to ensure that everyone has access to the content we are expecting them to learn. Yeah, briefly, I will say that um, when we talk about the curriculum, I want to make clear that I was not responsible for the curriculum in total, okay? Because the curriculum has several subjects. I think in Alberta, there are nine, nine different subjects, including French language, social studies, math, phys ed, et cetera, drama, et cetera. So 
I was asked to provide my advice on the English language arts curriculum. Now, that, that was a huge job because I spent the first three months basically reviewing every English language arts curriculum in Canada, in every province, as well as we accessed and I reviewed every um, several uh, English language arts curricula in the US from states that have really high scores in reading, as well as from states that they have very low scores in reading to compare and see do they have common areas? Are there any areas in which some diverge? And that has probably helped teachers and, and states to become better or provinces to have better scores. Now, most of the English language art curricula in Canada, they're quite outdated. They have been developed in early 2000s. And that's when ours was developed too. And that's why we, it was about time to create a new one to be more in line with current research findings. That is the reason why, for example, in the new, uh, the new draft that will be implemented in schools as of this September, you see that there is a component on morphological awareness. And we ask the teachers to teach it in 2000, there was very little information about morphological awareness. Nothing was included about morphological awareness in the, in the current English language art curriculum. Now we have included that. We also added components that, are, that we found out from the research that has been conducted over the last 20 years. Now, I know it has been a very contentious topic. Um, all I can tell is that the people who are aware of the science of reading and the people who have read a few articles about the importance of systematic structured instruction, they can see this reflected nicely in the new English language arts curriculum. There might be one line or two lines that they don't like, and there are contentious issues even today. We don't know everything about language. There are things that maybe in five years from now, some newer research will say you have to up this and it was not there before. So <clears throat> in general, the people who understand and they have been participating in these kinds of professional seminars on science of reading and the right to read, etc they can see the value of the new English language as curriculum. Most of the criticism that I have seen and read comes from people that they are balanced literacy trained people or whole language trained people that they don't understand that systematic and structured instruction should come before the kids develop love for reading. Mm -hmm. And comprehension develops as the kids become accurate readers. Yes, of course. And we can work on language comprehension strategies at a separate time in the day from when we're working on the word recognition strategies. And for the people in Alberta, rest assured that we had a team of expert, international experts, I think in different media presentations, I mentioned a few of these names. Some of you have been attending their seminars and you have been registering to their webinars to learn from them. We engaged them and they graciously offered their expertise to review every component that fell under their area of expertise. So we engaged Robert Savage, who is the guru of reading interventions in Canada to review the phonics part. And he gave us his feedback. I did the same thing for every aspect of the ELA curriculum that you currently have in front of you. So I trust the experts. And same, you should ex uh, uh, trust the experts. 
I don't trust associations. So yeah. uh, with that, I will stop. And um, I, I hope that our teachers, we are open. We received, and I read, Catherine, more than 2,000 emails and letters from teachers with feedback about the ELA curriculum. We took several of those concerns into account and many of the teachers who had seen the first version and the current version, they must have noticed quite some changes. We, we listened to them, we revised quite a few, but I didn't change many of the things that research is now showing that they are important and that's the order in which they have to be taught. Yes, of course. And uh, I know before you've mentioned that this this draft curriculum does meet the recommendations, uh, the 32 recommendations from the Ontario Human Rights Commission, right to read public inquiry in the report because they addressed specific things that the Ontario curriculum needs to change to ensure that all students are... Each and every one. Like the, the Ontario Human Rights Commission was published after we had released the first version of the English language arts curriculum. And if you were to go through the recommendations in the Ontario Human Rights Commission report, you would see that they are all already included in the draft that was sent out to the schools. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Giorgio, for your time. And I look forward to uh, your responses in the panel question and answer session later today.